Oh, now I'm vertical. That's interesting. The other times I was horizontal. Um, when you when you pick a, a thumbnail for these things, it just like it starts counting down, and then it's like three, two, one, and then it takes a picture, and I'm always like, oh. <laughs> so I just like, uh, and it takes a picture, and then that's the thumbnail. Um, so hence the very surprised look on my face on most of these thumbnails. But um, this is not the live. We're doing like a live presentation later today on Instagram, on the EDI Instagram, uh, exclusive dressage imports. If you want to uh, see that, uh, go follow the Instagram and that goes off at 930 Pacific time. Um, Oh, six people already. Yeah, good job, guys. Um, but today I thought I'd have like a little mini conversation early in the morning about learning how to ride. <clears throat> learning how to ride is like, it's a process. It's, a, it's something that takes a long time and, and it's part of enjoying this sport if you can figure out how to enjoy it enjoy the process of learning how to ride you're gonna have a lot better time if you're just interested in competing and winning and doing well with in, in that way you're gonna struggle um i'm right here on finch let me see if i can get this flipped around finchy <clears throat> and um it's really, I think anybody that's in this sport loves the horses, loves being around them, and loves the, the kind of puzzle that the horsemanship is. Um, and so I think, I think that's kind of this foundation of figuring out uh, learning how to ride. <clears throat> read a, I've read a lot of books about high performance, but um, when you look at uh, expert pianists, uh, a lot of them, their first piano teachers are not experts. They just teach people to enjoy playing the piano. And I think the same way about horsemanship. You have to just enjoy being on a horse and have some spark, some curiosity about, um, how to figure out how to do it, some desire to be like the experts you're around um, or the experts that you see or are inspired by. And then you, you figure out the rest. You like get this spark and that drives you with work ethic because you're just like, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna do this. And then, uh, then you go to work. Um, the other thing, learning how to ride, this is a big thing of mine. I was never a big full training person. I was always riding a lot on my own. And the other thing that I did a lot of is sitting and watching. Uh, I was very lucky to be around some very, very good trainers. And I would always wake up early and go sit and watch them ride and try to figure out how to kind of mimic their body, mimic their feel. <clears throat> I think riding is, is such a feel-based sport and there's so much intricacy in the timing and the presentation that it's really important to watch other people because someone can coach you and tell you how to do something and that's extremely valuable. But it's really important also to be able to watch someone, watch some top rider present a certain feel to their horses. Um, and I have some little tricks there. Like if you're watching a top rider, don't, don't just watch them or watch the horse, but actually watch their body. And as you're watching them, try to mimic, um, even if you're sitting in a chair, standing up, try to mimic, uh, put my reins down here, how they, how they have their shoulder 
or how they are in their in their upper body. Jacksonville, Florida. Hi, Pat. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, if you if you're watching riding, think about it this way. Hi, Finchy. Hi, Finchy. Um, hi, Mary from Kentucky. Yeah, so if your toes are turned out and your your butt is under, like, think about that. Um, turn those toes in, make that leg long. Susan from Oregon. Um, think about your pelvis here, rolled under, tipped forward. Um, Sue Baker from the UK. <clears throat> Okay, so if you're, if you're watching top riding, think about that. Like, the position is important. Think about, I always tell people, like, roll your pelvis under and square your shoulders. Victoria from California. <clears throat> but when you're, when you're watching people, you can think about the body position. Think about where their hands are. Are they too low? Are they too high? How are they doing these things? And then, and then go into mimicking mode. Uh, not necessarily verbalizing everything, but um, mimicking everything. Sweden. We got people on here from Sweden. What do you think about that, Finchie? <laughs> okay. Um, other pieces of learning how to ride. Here, this is a good one. So if you're trying to learn how to ride Grand Prix, um, there's no way, no possible way uh, that A, that it's going to be easy and B, that you're going to be able to do it, like figure it all out just on one horse. Uh, I think it's sometimes you have certain horses that are going to do the Piaf Passage well. Liz from North Carolina. Sometimes they have horses that are going to do the Piaf Passage. Sometimes have horses that do all the canter work, but not the rest. Um, so instead of thinking in a linear fashion of like being too strict in terms of what you can learn from each horse, sometimes you can learn the trot work of the Grand Prix on one horse, even if they, even if they're not going to do the canter pirouettes or not going to do the um, the other stuff. And actually, sometimes. I think of it that way. If you work on a horse's strong suit, if you work on a horse, uh, do um, you guys still here? <laughs> I do think I'm gonna have to switch to another carrier if I keep doing these live things. Um, <laughs> Oh, we lost a few people when I disconnect. Let's see. What else? Do you guys have any questions about learning how to ride? I, I do think, so coaches, it's way too hard, way too difficult to figure out how to ride entirely on your own. It's, it's, there's too much information and, and we always draw on the experiences of others. So part of what you have in a coach is someone who's seen a lot, someone who's uh, watched a lot of people or trained a lot of horses, has a lot of experience. There's no substitute for experience. So when you read, read the book on dressage training, when you go to these sources, older trainers, that's part of what you're getting. Um, that said, I think the best riders um, they need, like it's, there's a certain component of learning how to ride that's just an individualistic process. It's just you really figuring out and being receptive to the horses, learning how to listen to the horses and understand what they need. And I think that's, that can't get squashed. Um, so if you're, if you're in a full training program, you still have to be thinking and processing and learning, learning how to ride um, on your own. Jess is just leaving there. She takes her kids to school. That's Jess right there. 
That's Mackenzie over there getting horses ready. Yeah, and, and then like, don't discredit yourself. Don't, part, part of my favorite part of riding is this like problem solving kind of uh, figuring things out, trying to think creatively about how to solve problems. And I think sometimes that gets squashed with traditional training programs where we're, this is the how, how to do it, and then you're just executing that. So uh, I think you're always gonna have problems. There's gonna be problems with horses. You're gonna be trying to figure out, how do I get the change clean? How do I teach the Piaf? How do I do all of these things? And um, that's part of it. That's part of like a really fun part of the horsemanship. So embrace that figure it out and keep working on it. Um, Finchy, I'll talk about Finchy a little bit. He's been really fun because he's been here now for three, four, five, six, seven, four years. Has it been four years? <laughs> three years? Um, He's been here for a long time now. So I started riding him when he was three and now he's seven. Um, he's a very special horse. We took him to Chicago. Uh, he's owned by Lori, uh, who she is wonderful. She comes down and rides him every once in a while. And she has a bunch of her own horses uh, in Central California. Um, Finch is a horse that um, He's very receptive to the training. He's very intelligent, very sensitive. Uh, he's Tricaner. He's Tricaner on the mother line. So for romance, Latimer. Latimer is Tricaner. And he has a, a desire to figure things out uh, that's really fun to work with. So if you... If you put him in a situation where he has to problem solve or figure out what you're asking, he goes to work. He starts searching. Uh, and that's one of the, the best components of uh, trainability. If you, if you put your horse in a situation they don't understand, that they search for the right answer. And that's been like teaching him the piaf, teaching him the leg lifting, all of that stuff. It's been really quick about picking up on that. Finchy. My mirrors are always like, so this is in the sun, so the mirrors look really good. Over here in the shade, they get water on them or like dew on them. So then they get a little bit foggy like that. Um, let's see. I should talk a little bit about the barn setup. The barn is squished back to back. So we have these open aisleways. And part of that is like the barns are squished together. Instead of having a traditional aisleway that runs through the barn, uh, we put the barns, the stalls together so they could be more like a herd. And then there's, if you see there, there's a lot of transparency between them. So they, um, the horses get to kind of sleep like a herd together and be together. And it does seem like they're very happy um, grouped together like that. A traditional barn, the barn, an aisleway runs down the middle and then the horses are split apart. Um, obviously they, they do fine in those types of barns here, but two, but we don't really need that here. Like we we're so fortunate with our weather that uh, the, the kind of, worst it gets is a, a little rainstorm so and they do they do fine in this type of barn with a rainstorm so that's the barn let's see 17 people do you guys have any specific questions questions about training questions about the program um let's see i'll talk about the sport i like so obviously there are major struggles in the sport involving money um, which is a weird contrast because the sport is so pure to me. The horsemanship is so pure and natural and fun to work with. And then this sport has so much influence of money in it. 
and and that's a it's a it's a factor it's a struggle and i i think there is a reality in it that you can learn how to ride on just about any horse that you have um so that's the important part let's see how often do you compete or is your main business just really pr purchasing and preparing horses for sale um, yeah, so I don't compete that often. Most of it is sales horses, um, but I will compete when I'm ready. Um, I Early on, I competed a lot, and I really like slowed down a little bit and want to present stuff when it's ready. Um, but I am looking forward to competing this season I have uh, Guapo the Stallion that I will compete. Birta, I think, will compete the other Stallion. I'll probably compete Finch here. Um, but yeah, it's mostly sales. Mostly sales horses. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. The origination of the sales program came from a desire to um, fund a competitive program. So instead of just waiting for a sponsor to come along and buy me nice fancy horses, I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to build it myself, be able to compete myself, um, and, and fund it myself. I didn't like the idea of just, uh, having a sponsor pay for, for a fancy horse. And also I, I was, um, excited about horses and um, being able to develop them and being able to have a barn full of horses that had potential. So instead of a bunch of old horses in the barn, I wanted to have, you know, go through the barn and be like, all these horses are going places. Um, so trying to figure out a model where it's not just a sponsorship model, but really a model that is um, self-sustaining. If we built a sales barn and could figure out how to keep really good ones um, then and develop them with time, then maybe we could figure out how to compete at the top levels of the sport. And that's, that's also been part of the reason for the stallions. Can we figure out a way to fund the stallions, get income from collecting them, and be able to keep them a little bit longer and compete with them that they can kind of fund themselves okay someone on here asked if you guys have questions drop them down there uh, sometimes they go quickly though and i'm in the middle of answering something else someone asked about the shipping boots um it's a good question because they noticed that i don't put shipping boots when i pick up from jet pets uh, so this is a thing so when they come to jet pets they have come on an airplane, they have come on a trailer to the place, and when they're on the airplane, they take all shipping boots off. Why? Because shipping boots and wraps oftentimes will get stuck, and when they're in the airplane, and the box is next to each other, they can't take the wraps off. Um, so they don't have wraps on the airplane. Now, if when they get to Jet Pets, they do their quarantine, if I stick shipping boots on, that they haven't had on before. Sometimes, um, sometimes they'll kick at those shipping boots. So sometimes they do more harm than good because if they're kicking at the shipping boots, they're still kicking the back of the trailer and they can hurt their leg or their foot. Um, obviously, sometimes they do good. Sometimes they protect themselves from injury. They're there for a reason. So, um, yeah. Someone asked, is Guapo going to stay with me forever? Now, that's a good question. I would hope so. Um, but I've become very cautious about announcing, um, announcing the future as, like, uh, I'm not really sure. I do want to compete. And at all young horses are question marks. They're question marks as to whether they're going to do Grand Prix, whether they're going to um, make it all the way. Uh, and, and money is a factor. Like I don't, 
have unlimited funds. If I had unlimited funds, absolutely, I would love to keep Guapo forever and never sell him. You can get on, Mackenzie. You don't have to wait for me. Okay. Um, so I don't know. That's the question. I would love to keep him forever. Um, that is right now the plan to develop him. He's a little bit small for me, um, for the big arena, for if I'm going to try to compete in Grand Prix. Um, but yeah, lots of people, Mary commenting in, everybody likes these live things. Um, let's talk a little bit about the channel. So I did so much vlogging, meaning vlogging, meaning like. Uh, documenting my day and these big edits and like, and I, I love that, but that is so like time intensive. So a vlog takes three to four hours to edit a good one and a lot of time to film. And right now we have 15 horses in the barn. Um, I have another rider, Mackenzie, right there. So it, it takes a lot of time to do uh, the vlogging. Say hi, Mackenzie. <laughs> um, so that takes a lot of time. I do, so I'm, I've been a little bit lost in terms of like, what do I do with the channel? How do I keep it fun and interesting and exciting, produce good content as I'm super busy? And so, like something like the Carl Hester video that I just made, me watching another video. Sure, it takes time. That took me uh, maybe an hour and a half, two hours to film, make, and produce, but that's a lot less than a, a vlog. Um, so it's really a time thing as to some of you have wondered, like, why am I producing less videos? There's just one of me. <laughs> and uh, riding all these guys and trying to live a good life and be happy. Um, man, I lost that, that question. Somebody answered, asked a question. I don't know how to find the old questions. Oh, that's a bummer. If somebody just commented with a question, ask it again. But yeah, I, I love the YouTube. I wanna keep doing it. I wanna keep growing the channel. I wanna do more different types of content. So I'll keep after it. Oh, I like the wraps, Mackenzie. Look at these wraps. This is Zeno and Mackenzie with stylish gray wraps with black under wraps. Looking very sharp. Do you have any comments for our live viewers? <laughs> yeah, it is cold. The worst feeling when you're cold. Ooh, somebody says you're looking very stylish. Mary says. Thank you. Um, the worst feeling is when you take off your jacket when you're about to get on a horse because you're like, well, I'm gonna be hot in like about five minutes, but I have to take my jacket off. Let's see, what did you learn from building your own barn? What would you do different? Planning a trip to come to Florida. Um, uh, Florida, no Florida this year for me. I'm staying here. Um, what did I learn from building the barn? A ton of stuff. It is insanely hard to build a barn. Uh, the permitting process was, I think, the most frustrating, especially in this area. It took a year and two months to get a permit to build that structure, that barn. Um, that was a pain in the butt. Um... There's a lot. I was, I was worried about that. It's, I have the same philosophy. There's no substitute for experience. Jess and I had zero experience building a, a, uh, a barn. Um, so 
uh, yeah, I mean, figure out a way to be in flux with it, invest in good footing. This, this arena is an ebb and flow, which means it pumps the water out and pumps the water in. That was one of the best investments we made. Um, uh, invest in good footing, get mirrors, um, think through how it will be operating. So, uh, think about it, think about it, think about it even more and, uh, think about how, you know, ask people, consult with people. We asked Sergio, um, where he wants the cross size. Originally we were going to put the cross size back there and that would have been a disaster because this is more central to how we handle the horses. Um, it's really nice to be able to see everything. So under saddle here in the arena, I can see almost all the horses in the barn there. And then I can see over here, the turnouts. Um, I can see the walker. Um, that's nice. So, I mean, there's so much, so many little things you learn. It's, it's just the barn building is just like problem after problem after problem. So it's just uh, problem solving. Um, be careful with the contractors. Make sure that they give you a quote and stay to that quote and don't get halfway done and want more money. Um, uh, yeah, really think about it from a horse perspective. How do you, how do you want this to work for your horses? Um, and then adjust to fit things. Do you help your fi Europeans find good youngsters on a lower budget? Do you have a fee for your services? Yes. So this is a really good question. People who, uh, we don't take people to Europe, but if you, if you have a lower budget, um, you have to take a little more risk and you can end up with a very good quality horse. So for example, Finch, um, Lori bought Finch without, um, without seeing him. Uh, I, I always tell that story because that allowed her to get into Finch quite a bit cheaper than she would had she tried him here several times. And she really trusted us. She said, I trust you guys pick out a horse for me. Obviously we sent her videos, she saw him, um, but that whole transaction happened in part because we could get into a lower price point. Um, and, and so uh, about helping Europeans find horses, um, yeah, of course, uh, we can help you guys. Sometimes it's easier for you guys just to go look and drive and search. Um, but we do have several contacts and we do have several young horses over there. Um, so feel free to ask us a question, shoot us an email. Um, the people I worked for had a lot of problems with the court until they learned the magic word. See you in court. Hmm. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, let's see what else? Mackenzie, there's Soulmate over there getting ready. I think that's about it, guys. 45 people. Um, do, do you, what do you think of X racehorses for dressage? I, I touched on this topic the other day. I think dressage is awesome for all horses. I think dressage is really about horsemanship. It's about understanding how to teach horses things. It's about um, acceptance of the aids, acceptance of uh, communication. So um, for X race horses, for all horses, I think it's amazing. I don't think X race horses are going to be going to the Olympics anytime soon, but you never know. I mean, there are crazy, crazy things that happen. I just don't think they're bred to do it. Um, but that doesn't really matter. Like the thing is, A, you can learn from it. You can figure things out. Um, 
And I think it's, it's great for the horse. It's, it's a fun project to work on. Let's see, Mackenzie busting some little collection, little pirouette. Looks pretty good. Let's see, what else about learning how to ride? Um, if you really want, if you're like on the high performance track, you really have to get around someone who's um, at the top of the sport or been, been a top rider. And if you can't, if you're in the middle of nowhere, have no coaches, then you have to try to watch videos, go to clinics, get insight and put your head down and work and ride horses and figure it out. Um, hours in the saddle and not just hours in the saddle, actively trying to figure out um, uh, how, to, how to ride, how to teach the Piaf, how to teach the canter pirouettes, how to ride like Isabel Wirth, how to ride like Carl Hester. Um, it's a huge factor. Just sit, watch videos. We have so many tools with uh, the, the education we can get from the internet these days, so use it. Um, in terms of like one of the things that I, I think about that really helped me is coming from the natural horsemanship world where you have um, an education of how horses think. Uh, having an education of how horses think enables you to um, teach them to problem solve better. And I think that's sometimes missing in dressage. I think in dressage we're often it's there, the fundamental piece is there. The good trainers know that, but we don't talk about uh, that broad philosophy. And I think that can be really powerful, how to set it up and let them find it. Kind of that like Ray Hunt, Tom Dorrance, Buck Brannaman, natural horsemanship approach of like, how do horses learn things? How do we teach them things? Um, so that's really important to, to work on and understand. I, I started thinking about like acceptance to the AIDS. We talk a ton about acceptance to the AIDS. How often do you talk about defiance to the AIDS? And I've thought about, I think the better you understand defiance to the AIDS, the better you can teach them to have acceptance to the AIDS. And if you ride horses long enough, you're gonna find defiance to the AIDS. To the AIDS. You're gonna find when they kick out at the leg. Um, and the better you can understand, like if they're kicking out at the leg, um, how do I get acceptance of the aids where I put that leg on and they reach that hind leg under the body? Um, so thinking about how to set things up in a better way so that they, they find it, um, easier. I think, I think understanding a philosophy in which we teach our horses. That's really, really important. We have almost 40 people, 39 people on here, 16 likes. That's pretty good. Let's see, I would walk over there, but I will definitely lose you guys. Our turnout is over there with Benji in the turnout. Let's see, can we zoom on this thing? Benji. Um, what else do you guys want to know? Again, I'm doing a live thing with some of the sales horses at uh, 9.30 this morning. And um, tune into that on Instagram, on uh, the EDI Instagram. Look at Benji. Benji? Benji? Oh, now all of a sudden I saw all the, all the comments. Oh, we got all the comments here. Hmm. All right, guys. I'm signing off. Uh, yeah, tune in at 9.30. On, on not here. Not here. On Instagram. Got to go to Instagram, follow exclusive dressage imports. And uh, Suzy Q. Thank you for sharing your information and your time. We appreciate it.
All right, peace, guys.